Good morning. Can you all hear me well? Give me a quick shout out if you can hear me okay. It looks like my audio is coming through. Just want to make sure. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Whoops. Trying to turn my phone off and get it down. I'm having a little technical issues this morning, so apologize for the delay. <coughs> Excuse me. Welcome out. Welcome to Coach's Corner. My name is Tony Benson. It'll be the guide for the next uh, little bit, next hour or so. We're going to have a little fun. Well, try to always have fun, right? At least I do. So let me get the disclaimer up just so you can see that. Make sure you're well aware that we are not registered broker dealers, investment advisors. I will not give you any recommendations or advice. Everything that we do here is purely for educational purposes. If we're discussing trading, just assume that it is practice trading or paper trading. For regulatory reasons, we do not discuss live funded trading here. So, And just real quick, we'll go what is going. Oh, you guys can't see my screen. That would uh, probably help, wouldn't it? How's that? I was wondering why the uh, the boxes that I have up were different than normal. So I was a little uh, baffled by that. I couldn't figure out exactly what was going on and why it was had a different setup than before. So now I know. Good to know for the future. Of course, let me get. So I had the chat box up. There we go. Thank you. That's how I knew that you couldn't see. So I got to have that chat box up so you can talk to me, right? All right. So let's get back to it. So just uh, a, a brief overview of the upcoming events coming up in the next uh, few weeks. The premium online workshops, Trading You, which is twice a month, right? April 7th and 21st. So this is the seventh next week it is. Am I going crazy? No, it's not. It's, yeah, no, it's the following Monday. Where'd my mouse go? Forgive my mouse. I, I don't know what is going on. No, it's a week from Wednesday. So it's a week and a half away. I don't know why my mouse freezes up and it has been. I don't know if the mouse is bad. I've replaced the batteries. I don't know what's going on. So if you see my mouse freeze and <laughs> it did, bear with me. Uh, but trading you, yeah. So a week and a half is one. And then, uh, of course, two weeks later is the next one. Patterns of the Flash, uh, which is the twice twice a month bonus that comes with uh, Patterns of the Flash, the tool. that uh, That's one of the things that I created. And then Inner Circle is April 15th at 8 p.m. Monster Market Movers, April 22nd. And then on the right-hand side, you see there, well, there's mastermind groups at the bottom, which is Tuesdays, right, at 8 o'clock Eastern time. Free online workshops in the next uh, week or two. Power hour every week, right? And then Coach's Corner, this one. And then Patterns to Success, which is Monday, 8 p.m. Uh, today, we're going to talk more about options. I mean, we're always talking about patterns because they're pretty much everything we do. But we're going to focus more on options today. Uh, but on Monday, we're going to talk specifically about patterns and go deeper into patterns and flash and what it can do for you. And we'll do the same thing on April 7th at uh, 12 o'clock Eastern time. And then the other ones that Rob, the, uh, well, Power Options plays Rob, Cover Call Explorer, and then Brandon, the E-mini Think Tank. So you see those schedules there. So, so today, what are we going to talk about? Which strike price is the best one to buy? In the money, at the money, or out of the money? But real quickly before that, if we haven't met before and you don't know who I am or anything about what I've done, I basically, I've been doing this. Next week will be my 21 year anniversary. And excuse me just a second. Sorry, I had a little cough there. Uh, so yeah, it was April 3rd and 4th of 2000 when I first got it started. Uh, I was, found myself sitting in a workshop and just had my mind blown. Um, I went from there after about a year and a half and became a broker. Uh, from there, I went and did a little bit of prop trading, day trading, uh, which was an interesting experience, a very good experience. Uh, and I have also been coaching for, uh, I think, a, the better part of a decade, maybe even 15 years, um, depending on how in depth you consider coaching, but I've trained thousands of people all over the world, I've been to Ireland and Canada. And so say we're worldwide. Uh, but my niche is the thing that I love the most. And the thing that I really have specialized in 
pretty much since the beginning because I fell in love with patterns. When I started recognizing how powerful technical analysis was, and I learned about the patterns and how they work and function and the huge advantage they give me and how critical they are, I just dove in head first. And patterns are, in my opinion, the second most important thing you need to learn. Uh, the first, some of you are wondering, like, what's the most important? Well, emotional control. You can learn all the patterns in the world. If you can't control your emotions, then the patterns aren't going to mean anything. That's the big challenge. But patterns are critical, just as critical as the emotional side. You got to have both those pieces, right? So I dove in. And uh, out of my experience, not only my experience learning the patterns and understanding how important they are, but out of the frustration came a tool called Patterns in a Flash. And I'll share, I'll share more with that as we go. And you'll see. And if you want to see more in depth, like I said, Monday night, uh, we'll be talking more in depth about that particular tool itself and more in depth into patterns. But right now, we're going to stay focused on options. Which strike prices are the best options? Is there one that's better than the other? Which one? In the money, at the money, out of the money? And does it make a big difference? And how do you decide which one is best? But let's go back to just kind of start at the beginning. For some of you, some of you may be brand new. Some of you might have been at this a lot longer. So this will be remedial if you've been trading for a while. But there's basically, and we'll do this briefly, intrinsic value, right? So if you're brand new, there's in the money options have what we call intrinsic value. It's like equity in your home, right? If you buy a house for 100,000 and over five years, it goes up to 200,000, then you have 100,000 of equity, right? Or actually you probably paid down the loan some, but just to keep it simple. If you bought something at one price and it has built-in equity, so if you buy it for 100,000 and it's worth 200,000 when you buy it, but you only pay 100, then you have $100,000 of equity, right? In the Seattle area, if you buy a house for $100,000 and it goes up to $200,000 the next month, that's how insane it is here. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and in the money option has intrinsic value. In other words, you are paying for equity right up front. You're paying for it, okay? And an, an, the intrinsic value or the time value, because every op, not every option, but the in the money options have both components. They have a time component and the intrinsic value, right? They have the equity part, but then there's also a time component on most of them. Some of them don't have any because they're so deep in the money, but an option has a finite amount of time to it, correct? I mean, it has an expiration. So you can't hold it forever. That's one reason people consider them risky. Even though people buy milk and cheese and all these things at the store that expire too, they just have to use it before it expires, right? Same thing with an option. You just have a limited amount of time. So when you're making trading decisions, you've got to add one more component to it where you have to say, okay, how long is this trade going to take me? If you're a buy and hold person, you don't do options because they freak you out because you just buy a stock and hold on to it and expect that at some point it's going to be worth more, even though that's not necessarily reality, right? <laughs> But the part of the option that we pay for is the time premium, right? It's called a premium. It's just like an insurance policy. If you go to Geico or Progressive or Farmers or State Farm and you buy an insurance policy, they group them into six-month chunks, right? And you say, here's all the criteria that I have. Here's the kind of vehicle. Here's what it is, the year, the make, the model. Here's all the features. Here's what I need for insurance. I need to cover this, 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 and this. And they're going to come back and say, okay, for six months, it's going to cost you $1,000 to cover your vehicle. You give them $1,000, they give you an insurance policy for the next six months. So what you're paying for is that six months worth of time. Options function the same way. You're paying for six months worth of time or however much time you buy or sell. That is the, that's the part of the, the option that fluctuates, if you will. They all fluctuate because the price, the value of the stock is changing constantly, right? So every single minute that the price of the stock is changing, so the value of the options are changing. But the intrinsic value, if the price of the stock were to stay static, the intrinsic value would stay static too. It's only the time value that fluctuates. 
But obviously, and that, that's one of the things that makes options more complex, right? There's so many moving components to it. They're complicated, but they're really not. <laughs> Does that make sense? So if you break it down and, and really just keep it simple, then it's not that big of a deal. But what is the most expensive in the money option, right? Or what is this, the one that has equity, right? Is in the money. The most expensive options you're going to buy, and of course, we can get into a semantics war and say, what's the most expensive mean? But we're not going to do that. The one you're going to pay the most dollars for is going to be in the money, generally speaking. Okay. The most expensive time value option. In other words, if an option has only time or it's mostly time, typically that's at the money. So one of the things about in the money options is usually, especially it depends on how deep you go in the money. If you go deeper in the money, you have more intrinsic value, right? You have more equity and the time value will shrink and you'll pay very little for time. At the money options, if it's truly exactly at the money, then it is all time. You're paying purely for time. And that is where your most expensive time value typically is, is at the money. The least expensive time value option are the out of the money options. And the further out of the money you go, the less expensive they get, right? Because it's based on risk reward of how much the stock may or may not move. If you got a hundred dollar stock and you buy a two hundred dollar option, what are the odds of the stock moving from a hundred up to two hundred? It gets slimmer and slimmer, right? Versus a hundred and ten. A hundred and ten dollar out of the money option is going to be significantly more expensive than the two hundred because the odds of the stock moving to one ten are much higher than it moving to two hundred. And obviously there's lots of time components moving in there. But the secret really is knowing which one to buy and when. And there really is the one size fits all approach. There isn't a solid answer. And I know from a mental perspective that a lot of us come to the market and we want a systemized approach. And we can create a systemized approach and we can put rules in place. But there isn't one specific system that works for everybody. It's just like fast food restaurants. You got McDonald's, you got Burger King, you got Chick-fil-A, you got Chipotle, you've got Subway, you've got Jimmy John's, you've got, I mean, how many different fast food restaurants are there? Right? And they all have different products, they all have different approaches, different ways they do things. And trading's really no different. You could, you could go set up a fast food restaurant if you wanted to, right? And you could do it differently than McDonald's, or you could do it the same as McDonald's. McDonald's has created a system, but that doesn't mean you can't take and duplicate their system and make some modifications to it, which is essentially what they all are, right? They're all effectively the same system with just some changes. You know, Chick-fil-A sells chicken. McDonald's sells mostly beef. Right? I mean, they're not a whole lot different, but there isn't a, there's not a one size fits all. Approach. And trading is no different. We can create whatever we want. And that's the beauty of it. This is your business. I can give you some general rules of thumb. I can say, here's what I would suggest doing based on my experience and what I know. Here's probably the path to follow. But if you want to go a little bit different route, or if you want to take that path and it goes somewhere different, fine. We're all working with different amounts of capital, right? We all have different risk tolerances, different life experiences, different you know, emotional levels, different fear levels. So what you've really got to do is figure out where you're at. Personally, I mean, this is a, you got to look in the mirror thing and say, where am I at? How much capital am I working with? Where am I at? Where's my emotional skill level at? Where's my chart reading skill level at? What's my knowledge of options? So you've got to really be brutally honest with yourself of where you're really at. And figure that part out first and then say, okay, based on that, this, here's what I'm going to do. Because some of the things I'm going to show you today break the rules. But I've also got over two decades of experience trading. So, And sometimes bending the rules or breaking the rules is okay. You just have to calculate, okay, if I'm going to break this rule, what's, my, what's the calculation? What's the risk reward? So what I'm going to show you right now are just basic general rules of thumb as far as what which options are you buying. For a short-term trade, I'm typically looking for in the money, 
a delta of 65 or higher, right? Again, these are general rules of thumb where, okay, this is what I'm looking for. I want at least 65. Now, if I find an option that's about 60, am I gonna turn the trade down because it's off by five? No, if, I, if it's a 70, I'm looking for somewhere around 65. Usually I won't go below 60. Typically 70, between 70, 80 is kind of the high end of the range. I'm not buying something that has a 90 or 100. And the reason for that is they get more expensive, right? The higher the delta you go, the more expensive they get. And if you pay a lot for intrinsic value, your rate of return goes down. I mean, the more you spend for an option, the lower your rate of return becomes. And the purpose of trading options is for leverage, right? That is what they do. They give us leverage. And that is the whole intent and the whole purpose of trading options. So why take something, a tool that you're utilizing leverage for and pay way too much for it and get rid of the leverage that you're there for? That makes sense? So if you go too deep in the money, you lose your leverage. Midterm trades, so, and when I say short-term trades, that's typically 30 days or less. Midterm trades, usually 30 to 90 days, between 30 and 90 is typically what most people consider midterm. Uh, again, those are not necessarily hard and fast rules, they're just my take on it. Usually a midterm trade looking for 65 delta. It's basically the same as, in, as a short-term trade. If I go out of the money on a midterm, which don't do very often, but occasionally I do. Usually out of the money options, I'm looking for a delta of about 30. If I'm gonna trade out of the money, I'm looking for something about 30. And rarely do I do a midterm trade, which is you know 30 to 90 days is not a super long time, especially to go out of the money. Typically when I do this, it's on a higher price stock. I mean, you get into the Teslas and the Amazons of the world, the Googles and the Apples, it, well, Apple's not monstrous, but the options get super expensive. To go in the money gets really, really expensive. And again, a lot of it depends on how much capital you're working with. You know, some of you might be able to trade those higher flyers, some of you may not. Most of the examples I show are smaller dollar trades. I've got six different accounts I manage. Two of them are my kids. I just set those up last year for them, trying to get them going and interested in trading. They're 10 and 14, so trying to get them moving. And I just threw a little bit of money in the account for them to manage and learn and uh, but I basically, I, for the most part, I manage it for them. So out of the six accounts that I handle, three of them are small. So uh, a lot of the ones you're going to see today are ones that I've done in those accounts. And of course, remember, I, I know there's a lot of a lot of people jumping in here right now. The trades that we talk about here were considered paper trades. The beauty of today, especially with technology, is you can set up a paper trade and a pra or a practice trade and a funded trade with the same setup. And it triggers all at the same time, right? So you can mimic you can mimic paper trading real cage, but for regulatory reasons, we're going to talk about paper trading here. So a midterm trade, I'm looking for if I'm going to trade out of the money, I'm looking for a delta of about thirty. And longer term trades, I will typically go out of the money. Just about every single long term trade I do, and when I say long term, I mean more than about ninety days. I'm almost always looking at out of the money options. And the main reason I want out of the money options is because you get that delta flip, right? If the stock moves big, if you buy something that's delta, where remember where we said the least expensive option is out of the money? If that option becomes in the money or at the money, now which one is it, right? Because in the money is gonna be the most expensive dollar wise. At the money is the most expensive time premium, and out of the money is the least expensive time premium. If I can buy, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here, <laughs> but that's all right. We'll repeat it because it's important. If I could buy the least expensive time value, and over a longer period of time, it flips and becomes at the money, and I can sell it at the most expensive time premium, then I'm getting the most bang for my buck, right? And that's really my ultimate goal is to buy the least expensive option and sell it when it's the most expensive. Now, notice if we go back to this, this is general rule of thumb for 
buying, right? If you're going long, either a stock or an option, whatever you want. Well, options, options, never mind. Options only. <laughs> what's the one? What's the one option between in the money, at the money, and out of the money? Which one are we missing here? Hey, Kevin, how are we doing? <laughs> That's funny, Patrick. Alley. Hola. Yeah, at the money, right? Why would you? Why would you not buy if you're buying an option? Why would you not buy at the money? It's the most expensive, right? Why would you pay the most for an option? And are there situations where you might do that? Yeah, it's pretty rare. I can't remember the last time I actually bought an at the money option. Now, when you're selling options, though, the general rule through them is what? Which ones do you sell? <laughs> Any one of them, right? It depends. There's, there's a lot more different variables when it comes to selling, right? What strategy are you doing? Because the strategy also comes into play, right? But there's lots of different ways you can do shell, selling strategies. And you can do in the money, at the money, or out of the money. But if you're selling something, you're collecting premium up front, right? Whereas when we're buying something, we're going to buy it at a certain price. We want it to go up in value and sell it. If we're selling, what do we want to have happen? Well, we either want the stock to move the way we want it to because then the value of the one that we sold because we're collecting money in the beginning, right? We're taking cash in. And then if the stock moves the way we want it to, then we can buy it back at a lower price. If we put five bucks in our pocket, they give us $5 to sell an option and the stock goes the right direction and it's only a dollar a couple weeks later, we can give them a dollar back and leave the four bucks in our pocket. We made a profit, right? You notice there's no long-term on here because if we're selling options, we're obligating ourselves to do something, correct? So if we're obligating ourselves to buy or sell something, then you want it to be as short a time as possible. We don't want a long-term when we're selling. In fact, the beauty that has transformed in the last 20 years of the market is now we're down to weeklies, even daily options. You can literally trade an option that expires at the end of the day. So there's a lot more options, pun intended, than there used to be in the old days. But really, when it comes to short-term trades like this, everything, especially when you're selling, whether you do in the money, at the money, or out of the money, it all comes down to the chart. What does the chart look like? What is the pattern that has formed? Because let's say that you know you have a stock that's at twenty dollars, it's bouncing at twenty dollars, and it's twenty dollars is very solid support, and it sits right at twenty dollars. Well, which one do you sell? And it looks like it's going to bounce, say, up to maybe twenty-five. Well, you could sell that the, at the money, the twenties. You could sell the puts, right? You could do a, a bull put spread. It all depends on the strategy we're talking about, right? But those two would basically be the same. So let's say you sell the 20s and buy the 19s. You're basically selling at the money. Then you're buying an out-of-the-money option for less, collecting a small premium there. But you've got your protection in place in case it tanks. And then if it bounces to 25, what happens to the value of both of those options? They're almost nothing, right? You could say, you know what? I don't. If it breaks below 20, I don't want to have that much risk. So you could go down and say, I'm going to sell the 18s. And then buy the 17s. You could do a bull put spread where you're selling it two bucks out of the money. You're going to get less of a, you're going to get less for it, right? It's going to be less expensive. So you're not going to have the rate of return, but you've got less risk, correct? So you don't make as much money, but you have less risk. Now you could, now that would be an out of the money, right? You could do at the money, which would be selling the 20s, buying the 19s. You could go out of the money, sell the 18s, buy the 17s. Or if you like to get aggressive and you want to do, say, a bull put spread and the stock's at 20, what if you sold, say, the 22s, which are in the money, correct? And then bought the 21s. You're still going to collect a premium. But you're in the money. You're going to collect a higher premium. 
you're going to get a lot more for that. In fact, I'm trying to think, should we just go look? I'm trying to see. Let me look real quick and see. Let me just give you a live example. Um, Patrick, yes and no. <laughs> it is. Uh, I'm going to look real quick. Bear with me just a sec. I'm going to see if I can just give you a live example. I'm going to I'm trying to find something. That's, I'm just going to use that $20 price point and see if I can find something that's right around 20 bucks. Uh, okay, there. Vuzi. This is one I've been day trading lately. Uh, it is a volatile stock. <laughs> well, I appreciate the honesty. Let me know. You should be able to see that. Okay, so here's the chart. Here's This is an intraday chart. This is a five-minute chart of it. And I basically want to go look at the options, though. So this stock is, in fact, we'll look at, okay, it's at $20.90. Look at a, uh, I don't want one minute. Here's my daily. There we go. So here's a daily chart. I mean, this thing's gone crazy like a lot of stocks have, right? It was four bucks. Uh, obviously, very volatile stock. It was 30 bucks just a few days ago. Now, if we look at options on this, here's our different strike prices, right? And we've got April. And the nice part of this, and, and this is if you're wondering, some of you all probably want this is think or swim, TOS, TOS, whatever you want to call it. I got two different brokers that I use. This is one of them. Um, but we've got, here's our different options we have, right? We've got 21 days, 56 days, 112, 203, 301. If we're going to sell an option, let's look at that real quick since we're on that subject. And look at the different things. And hopefully you're all familiar with a bull put spread. If you're not, then that's okay. Just, it's a little bit complicated, but stick with the numbers. Pay attention to what our different options are here. So on the right side, we've got puts. The stock's about 21. So let me grab my pen. There we go. Uh, red, gotta work. So if we sell, we're selling to bid, right? So we can sell right here. The $20 puts are going for $2.40. That's a pretty juicy premium for a $20 stock. That's a lot, actually. Huge. That's over 10%. It's 11, 12%. But let's say you don't want that much risk. Well, you don't want to take, you know, you gotta basically have $20 of risk minus 240. So you have $16 and or $17.60 of risk. For some of you, you're like, yeah, I don't want to take that much risk. Well, you can come over here and buy the 19s, right? So you sell this one and buy this one. That way, if it goes to zero, you've sold somebody the right to force you to buy it at 20. Now you own the right, you pay $2.10, you own the right to sell it at 19. Let's just say the stock goes to zero. It goes back to four bucks for whatever reason. I think this is a biotech or something like that, I don't remember. If it goes to zero or back to four, then somebody's gonna force you to buy it at 20, you turn around and force somebody else to buy it at 19, You've only lost one dollar, correct? So you only have one dollar at risk. Well, they put two dollars and forty cents. This one they put into your pocket, and then you take two dollars and ten cents out of your pocket and give it back and say, "Okay, here's my insurance policy. How much do you have left in your in your pocket? Thirty cents, right? So you're getting a credit of thirty cents, and you have one dollar at risk." which in reality, you have 70 cents at risk, right? You subtract the 30 cents because you put 30 cents in your pocket. If you end up losing, you're going to lose a buck, but you still have their 30 cents in your pocket. So you have 70 cents at risk. So that would effectively be selling an at the money option or it's slightly out of the money, but it's basically at the money. And as long as, whoops, let me clear that. As long as this stock stays above, That $20 price point, between now and expiration, April 16th, then you're going to keep that 30 cents, right? So let's just say you did 10 contracts. 
If you did 10 contracts, you've got a thousand bucks at risk, you've made 300. You actually have $700 at risk to make 300. That's a pretty solid rate of return, right? I mean, what is that? That's almost that's about 40%, isn't it? It's just off the top of my head. But let's say, you know what? I don't know if this thing's really going to stay up there. I'm afraid it might drop down below 15. So let's see if there's anything there. If we go back and look at the option chain, we're going to have to get some more strikes on here. That'll be enough. Nope. Uh, let's just put them on. No, that's too much. Let's go 14. That should be. Uh, okay, we'll say we'll, we'll go 16. We're going to bump it up to the 16. So if you need the 16 and 15, and again, let me get the drawing thing here real quick. You can sell the 16s. Right, so this is where you're selling. You're collecting 80 cents, and you would pay 70 cents for the 15s. So you're collecting 10 cents. Okay, so you make 100 bucks with 900 dollars of risk. It's not a bad rate of return, right? I mean, it's a little better than 10% for a month. That's better than your average mutual fund, right? And what is your risk? I mean, if you if you sell these ones, the 20s, and you buy these, the odds are significantly higher. Whoops, let me clear that. Odds are significantly higher that it's going to be below 20 in a month, right? Whereas the odds of it being below 16 are quite a bit less. So you have less risk by going out of the money. Because you're all the way down here at 16 versus 20. But you can see the rate of returns also significantly less. Now, let's flip this over. And this is super aggressive. Okay. So <laughs> this is something that I never saw taught. It's just something that I played with. And I'm not a huge spread trader. Okay. I'm just using this as an example so you can see the rates of return and how it works. If you wanted to go in the money with a selling strategy, this is strictly selling. Most of my trading I do is buying. I buy calls or puts. And I'm going to show you here in a minute. I'm going to show you some of the different trades I've done and why I did them. But let's say you want to be super aggressive and you can see that this stock has been as high as 30 recently. So what if you think it's going to go back up to 30? If you go in the money, I don't even know if we have, yeah, we do. If you went in the money, okay, now this is where you may not even Let's say you want to sell the 23s. You can sell the 23s, right? The stock's at just shy of 21. So that's over $2 in the money. You can sell those for $4.20. And you can buy, wow, this is not even a big difference. There's no sense in doing that. You can buy the, uh, this is why I don't do spreads. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You sell the 23s for $4.20. Buy the 22s for 390, that's still only 30 cents. That's not any different than the, there's the 20s and the, so it's still only 30 cents. Of course, there is more wiggle room, so you could maybe get, say, 50 cents out of it. You could maybe put an order in for 50 and they would hit it because you've got bigger spreads. Maybe I have 30 cent spread and a 40 cent spread here. It's not even that much more. This one's too volatile, I think, is why. A lot of times what you'll do is if you go in the money, because if you did this, let's just say theoretically, and I wouldn't necessarily suggest this, but if you did this in the money, you sell the 23s and buy the 22s, and let's say you get 50 cents versus 30 cents, you just collected a bunch more, right? And as long as the stock goes up and gets above 23, then you're going to keep that cash. You're going to keep the difference between the two, right? So going in the money gives you an opportunity to make a higher rate of return, but it also increases your risk. I mean, it comes down to basic risk reward, right? Uh, very good point, Will. Oh, it's a gaming corporation. Okay. That tells you. I, the beauty is that a lot of times I can care less what the stock does. I'm a chartist. I look at charts. The patterns are all that matter to me. What does the chart look like? 
It works. 23-21. Yeah, there's, and that's a great point. You could go and do a $2 spread, which increases your risk to two bucks. But if you did the 23-21, you get 420 and buy it for 320. So you have a dollar credit with two dollars with two dollars of risk. So you have a dollar credit with a dollar risk. That makes sense. Y'all see that? But it really ultimately comes down to what does the chart look like first? That's the number one question. And then the next question is, what's your risk tolerance? Which again, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. <laughs> Which for those of you who know me know that I do that sometimes. I get excited and my mind just goes to where I'm going. <laughs> well, that may have to change. Are you talking $60 or $60,000? <laughs> it's, all, it's all relative, right? So the ultimate question becomes, uh, you know, what does the chart look like and what's your risk tolerance? So again, getting to the process, and I want to get through this, and then we'll go look at all the ones that I've shown. Are you bullish or bearish? That's the first thing is where are you at on that particular stock or even the market overall? You bullish or bearish? What strategy are you planning on implementing? For me, the vast majority of my trades, I'm buying calls or buying and selling calls. I buy, them, I buy low, sell high. I'm buying a call or a put. I don't do a whole lot of spreads. I don't do many selling strategies. So yeah, Patrick, I, I, I go long. I'm basically buying or selling either a call or a put. I actually prefer trading the downside. I like puts more. Um, and the reason is because you get that delta flip, right? If a stock drops, what happens to the volatility? When the market freaks out and panics, what happens to volatility? The volatility goes up, right? And what happens to options prices when volatility is high? they pump more time value into it, right? There's more of a fear factor, so there's more time value. So if you buy an option when a stock is high and it drops and the volatility goes up, then you not only get the flip of the delta if you're doing an out of the money, but you also get the volatility addition. So that's one reason I love trading puts. But it all depends on the market conditions. What are the market conditions? Right now, I mean, well, at least over the last several months, it's been mostly bullish. And we're still mostly bullish, but we're kind of in a very mixed state with the market overall. Um, <laughs> yeah, bear coming soon. That's what I've been thinking for months, but the market can stay bullish for a long time. It can stay overbought for a long time without reality settling, settling in. So, and the third thing is what's your risk tolerance? So are you bullish or bearish? What does the chart say? What does the pattern look like? What strategy are you gonna use? And then how much are you willing to risk? And obviously this is important, determine whether or not you're bullish or bearish. It come, again, it comes back to patterns for me. What does the pattern look like? What strategy are you gonna use? Directional or non-directional? Directional, you're buying a call or a put essentially, right? Non-directional is you're selling options. And there's good and bad to both. There's great things for directional trades. There's great things for non-directional trades. The main reason I love directional trades is because the upside is wide open. If I buy a call for five bucks or a put for five bucks and the stock moves big, I have an opportunity to make 100, 200, 300, 400%. A non-directional trade, the selling strategies where you're collecting premium up front, even if the stock goes to the moon, that's all you're making. But it's also less risky and the stock doesn't necessarily have to move the way you want it to. If I'm buying a call, it has to move up for me to make a profit. And even if it moves up, I may not, depending on you know certain variables, mostly it's going to. If I sell a put and the stock just sits there and doesn't go anywhere, I'm still making money because I have the degradation of time. So there's pluses and minuses to both. And really it's one of those things, if you're in a place where you're brand new and you're trying to figure out which one you want to do or what you, first of all, go paper trade every one. That's what I did. I just paper traded every single thing I could just so I could understand the mechanics of the option strategies and how they worked and try to figure them out, right? A bull put spread is complicated. I didn't understand and really grasp a bull put spread until my fourth workshop. 
I had been through four two-day live workshops. This is back in the old days before we could do stuff online like this. And in the fourth workshop, I sat there where it was explained for the fourth time on top of me trying to figure it out. And all of a sudden I went, oh, okay, now I get it. Now I understand it. So uh, while options seem, in the beginning, they seem complicated, but it's like anything. Almost everything that you're new at seems complicated in the beginning, right? And then when you dive in and you really dig into it, then it starts to make sense. And if you get to that point where you get frustrated because you're trying to figure it out and you're new and you're like, I don't get it. It's too overwhelming. Keep going. Just keep going. Keep trying. Keep plugging away at it. Keep practicing because it will make sense. Okay. It does for everybody. Good point. <laughs> Frustration is a good thing. It means you care. Right. And the, the battle is, is fighting through it because this is, Trading is already difficult enough. When you add options to it, it becomes, it, it seems more difficult. It's really not. It's really, if you learn it to keep it simple and, you know, get rid of all the muck because that's the hard part. And it, it's human nature. We all, I did the same thing in the beginning. I just muddied the water unnecessarily. And so as a coach, that's one thing I, I work hard to do is try to, to get all that muck out of the water. Like, look, just keep it simple. And with regard to risk tolerance, you know, how much capital are you working with? How comfortable are you with the trade you're doing, with how much risk you're taking? Because risk reward really is another major component to trading. And you'll see as you go, and if you haven't seen I've done lots of stuff on risk reward. There's a bonus video session inside Patterns and Flash. It's all about risk reward, about why it's important and looking at it and seeing it from a different perspective than you maybe have seen it before. Uh, so, and that's really, how do you find candidates? <laughs> yeah, it's best if you're going to swing trade and day trade, keep them separate. I agree. So I've, I've recently gotten back into more day trading. Uh, I did it 20 years ago and I uh, hadn't really day traded, mostly just swing trade and pattern trade. But I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back at this again and, and have some fun. And um, it's more challenging for, for certain. The shorter time frame you squeeze trading into, the more difficult it becomes. So, but really, again, you know, I, I'm a patterns guy. Patterns are enormously powerful. I learned that right away when I first started, and uh, it's what I fell in love with. It's what I'm passionate about. I absolutely love it. So here are some examples, and these are um, trades that I did, right? Paper trades. For regulatory reasons, we call them paper trades. And again, I mean, with the beauty of technology, you can go place a paper trade and a practice trade. You know, if you do contingent orders or whatever, you can place them at the same time and mimic so whether we're talking about paper trades or real trades is it makes no difference, right? Um, yeah, day trading is quick and dirty because <laughs> it's fast, right? But the beauty of it, and this is, this is one thing that I know, I'm sure there's lots of people that have this question as well. How do you implement this in trading? Whether you're talking about patterns or options. I mean, patterns are my passion, options are the vehicle, right? But the reality is the time frame is really irrelevant when it comes to the core information, right? A pattern is a pattern, whether you're looking at a five minute chart, a daily chart, a weekly chart, a monthly chart, the pattern is the same. The concept is the same. How it plays out is the same. The criteria that we're looking for about what makes us strong, what makes it weak, it's all the same. When it comes to options, you know, the, the, the general rules of thumb, like you saw today, are pretty much all the same no matter what. So you take those those core rules and the core concepts and you just change the time frame and everything else stays the same. That makes sense? My thought on paper trading accounts, utilize them. I mean, paper trade as much as you possibly can. Paper trading is great to learn the mechanics. Okay, if you're new to trading and you need the mechanics of how a strategy works, how it functions, what happens if I buy this option or that option, paper trading will help you learn that quickly. The challenge with paper trading is that there's no emotional component. 
you don't actually have money on the line. So you can't really truly learn the emotional side of trading and how to manage and control your emotions with paper money. Because if it goes against you, what do you do? I mean, your emotions, it doesn't really hurt because it's not real money, right? Oh, we'll hold on a little while longer. And then it comes back and everything works out well. And then when you get in with real money, what happens? Then you panic and you get out and you lose and all of a sudden things are totally different. Yes, uh, Afan, I hope I pronounced that right, right Afan. Uh, these are being recorded and you're not the only one. So lots of people came in uh, after we got started. We got started five minutes late anyway. So I'm gonna go probably about five or 10 minutes long. Um, we had a couple technical little glitches, um, just getting things set up and stuff took a few extra minutes. So they, uh, I believe they're being recorded. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'm almost certain they are and they're available after the fact. So if that is incorrect, I apologize, but I'm, I'm pretty certain they are. So. <laughs> no, it's good, Patrick. Um, nobody else can see it, so that's good. Um, it is being recorded. Okay, thank you, Amy. I thought so. I just wanted to be certain. I said that, then I realized that, okay, maybe I'm crazy and I've lost my mind. Uh, Okay, but, oh, that's right. I forgot about that part. <laughs> we are being streamed on YouTube. That's right. So it should be on YouTube at some point too. Uh, <laughs> great, live for the whole world to see. So let me, since we've only got about 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, <laughs> thanks, Will. <laughs> I agree though. I did lose my mind a long time ago. Uh, you, you have to be a little bit crazy to trade, especially the way we do. So this is Peloton, and uh, these are all the, the four examples you're going to see. And uh, again, I bent the rules, um, you know, the general rules that I've given you here. And sometimes, you know, we do that. Sometimes you got to bend the rules. Um, sometimes you break the rules. But um, the one thing you have to know is where you're at. You know, I've been at this over 20 years. So uh, I've learned when, when bending and breaking the rules is okay, and then how to bend them and break them properly, if you will. I know that sounds maybe goofy, but um, it's it's difficult to trade successfully long term if you stick to really hard, rigid rules. Now, most of the time you have to. Most of the time the rules are rigid, you have to stick to them. There are some rules that are absolutely rigid; they can you don't break them, right? But sometimes you say, "Okay, I'm going to give a little leeway here." So this is Peloton, and I've got four, so I'm going to have to kind of hustle through this uh, to get to all of them. But basically, three of these worked out. Well, one of them worked out spectacular, this one. One of them I lost money on, and the other two are still in process as far as paper trades go. So, so Peloton, this is one that I put inside Patterns of the Flash. There is now, over the last eight weeks, we put a pattern of the week. So once a week, I go find a pattern uh, that I like. It's the favorite one that I've seen that week. And I go do just a short video anywhere from, I think the shortest one was five or six minutes up to 20 or 25 minutes. Um, but basically I just cover that pattern. What I see, I give you my analysis on that particular stock, on that particular chart, what it looks like and what might happen next. So essentially I'm giving you a candidate. Once a week, you're getting a pattern of the week saying here's a potential candidate. This was one of them back on uh, the 8th is when I believe the 7th or the 8th of February is when this posted up inside Patterson of Flash. Um, as the pattern of the week. And a, this is a head and shoulders. If you're not familiar with the head and shoulders, let me draw it on there real quick. So here's the head, right? This is the extent of my artistry, okay? Left shoulder, right shoulder, right? And that's how good I am. That's a head and shoulders. Um, so this is a bearish reversal pattern. So we're looking for the stock to drop. If you get a pattern like this, it's just basically weak, right? Yeah, head and shoulders is my favorite. This is my favorite price pattern. There's price patterns and candlestick patterns. And patterns in a flash is something you wanna check out. If, if you still are learning, if you're new and you're not that familiar with charting, or even if you're not new and you've been around charting for a while, you need patterns in flash. Let me just say it that way. I'm a little biased, obviously, since I created it. But at the same time, I know that it will give you tremendous benefit. So basically then what we do is you take that, you can see that red line. This one right here is what we call the measured move. 
And that is what we expect it to move if it breaks. Okay, so this is what we expect the stock to move. So then if I see a pattern like this, thank you, Will. Will Will's been around for a long time. I don't know. We've we've been I've seen you here in these for two or three years. He said, I highly, highly suggest everyone do patterns and flash course. It's really good. There's over eight hours of video in there. There's flashcards, there's quizzes, there's bonus videos. Um, and then there's two live web classes, just like we're doing now. Two a month, I do this for one hour each. So you get two hours of live instruction. And we'll look at candidates just like this, uh, plus the pattern of the week. So getting back to this. So then basically what we do on, let me get, actually, let me, let me get to the candlesticks real quick. There we go. So now we look at candlesticks, shift it over, and you can see the pattern. It's still the same pattern, still looks the same, just we have a candlestick view. And then I put a trading plan in place, and I look at this and say, okay, well, where would I stop out of this? If it breaks the neckline, if it breaks that red line, then, and I get into the trade, then where would I expect it to move, where would I expect to get out if it goes backwards? Well, I put that stop up at 152. It's way, way above the neckline, but this stock moves big, right? It's Peloton. It's $150 stock. The thing moves 10, 12 points in a day. So I've got to give it enough room to wiggle, right? I can't put it too tight. There's got to be enough room for it to dance around and give it that space, right? So the trading plan is it stops at 152. My target is at 122. The question is, which, op which option do you trade, right? That's what we're talking about. Do you go in the money, at the money, or out of the money? Well, being an extremely volatile stock, These things, if I remember right, were trading for, I think about 25 or 30 bucks for an in the money option that was about a delta of around 65. That's 25 or 2,500 or $3,000 per contract. That's expensive for most people, right? And some of you might be able to trade that amount. Some of you can't. In some of the smaller accounts that I have, I wouldn't trade that. I wouldn't put that much of it at risk because they're small accounts, right? So then what's your other option? If I'm going out of the money, what I'm looking for, and this is, again, going back to patterns, and if I'm doing a midterm, preferably usually a long-term or a midterm, and I'm going out of the money, then what I'm looking for is where's the target? Because that's the option I want to buy. And in this case, you can see Peloton, the target, the green line is 122.10. So my target for this stock, if it breaks down and it goes lower, the target's 122.10. So I went and looked at the 125s, okay? And here's, this is the day that the trade actually triggered was 2.10. You see it moved a couple days and it actually hadn't, it didn't close below the neckline. And so this is where I fudged one of the rules. I broke the rule a little bit and I got in a little bit earlier because normally you wait for this thing to break the neckline. But something in my gut, and, and sometimes I don't follow my gut a lot, but sometimes it's just, there's a gut feeling. You're like, okay, I gotta, sometimes you just go with your gut. In this case, I went with my gut. I didn't wait for it to break. And I, you know what? I'm just going to dip my toe in the water. I'm going to get just a little piece, just in case it does break and it breaks big, then at least I'm there. And then I can always add to it later, right? So this is the actual recording of it, right? This is showing it. So on 210, right? But the 125s. The April's that was about, I think this was, well, yeah, that was about five or six weeks. So it was, it was a short midterm trade. And they were $6 and 35 cents versus the in the money options were 25 or 30, right? So I've only got 1200 bucks on the line. It's not a huge trade, right? But this is in one of my smaller accounts. So I don't have room to do one of the larger trades, right? So then, of course, what happens the next day, or no, I take that back. It was a, a few days later, and this is another rule I broke because <laughs> I'm transparent. You can see the one day it, it ran above that stop line. And this is where, okay, so the stop was there, but I didn't stop out. And why not? And this is one of the reasons I love, especially on higher price, more volatile stocks, I'll go out of the money. Because it wasn't that far above my stop, and this is where I, I had to make a judgment call, right? And exactly, that's the question is, is it just a head fake? Is it just going to go a little bit above the stop and then turn around? And you never really know. So the question becomes then, okay, my rule is I'm going to stop out here. But I've got an option, an out-of-the-money option where the delta is small. So it's probably at 20 at that point. 
So every dollar the, the stock moves, it's only costing me 20 cents extra. So as it moves against me, it's costing me less and less and less. Hopefully that makes sense. So then the question becomes, okay, it's at my stop out point. Do I give it a little bit of room to wiggle and see if it's just a head fake? And if I do, how much extra will I risk? Because now I'm at my point where I'm supposed to stop out. So then it becomes a risk reward question. Is it worth a little bit extra to find out if maybe this is just a head fake or not? And in this case, I decided it was. And fortunately, because I've had it happen the other way, this time the next day it tanked, right? And it worked out. I've had other ones where I've taken that little bit of extra risk and the next day it keeps going up. So it cost me a little bit more than it would have originally. But you can see where it dropped off right the next day and then the day the last day on the screen there you can see where it broke the entry point of 152.13 now i could have added more to it at that point i did not i can't remember why exactly so what i ended up doing though is selling out i put an order out for half of it okay on the 17th right so it was seven days later i threw an order for half of it at nine bucks I bought them for 635, right? I got filled at 635. I threw in our, I thought, you know what? If we get hit at nine bucks, I'll take, you know, that's two and a half bucks. It's about a 30% rate of return for a week, week and a half. Not too shabby. But I only did it. Notice I only did it on one, right? I originally bought two contracts. I ended up just selling one. So that will close out half the position. And then if it keeps going, if it keeps tanking, then I'll keep making money. Right. Well, it didn't notice the next couple days. Now we're two days forward we're on the 19th. The next two days, it actually bounced up a little bit. Which I looked at it, it got back up around that 142.13, that entry point. I thought, you know what, maybe we re reload this thing. Maybe I put it back in. And sure enough, that's what I decided to do. Looking at it going, you know, we've got a little doji day and maybe it'll tank from here. So you can see I bought to open one more contract. So basically put that one that I sold at nine, I bought it back for 745. So now I'm back in a full two contracts, just like I was originally. So now I've got, basically I have one contract at 635, one at 745. So we're at, what's that? 1300 bucks for 1350, 1370 of risk, right? And that's if you don't calculate the 235 bucks I already banked in profit, right? I've already banked 265 bucks in profit. And then what happens the next day? Boom, it drops 14 bucks. That was a happy day, right? They always are, right? And you can see what happened is I had, I had placed a GTC order out. I can't remember when I put it in there, probably that morning, probably first thing. I put it out there for 10 bucks and it filled at 801. And that was just one. Again, I thought, you know what? If I can bank, I just paid 745 for it yesterday. If I can bank another 250 bucks in a day, why not? And then you take the risk off the table. Now I've got about 500 bucks of profit in the bank from these two contracts I bought and sold. And I still have one contract left. So if it keeps tanking, then I keep making money. And it kept going and going all day long. I think it was down six or eight points when it triggered this. And by the end of the day, it was down 14. I went, hmm, well, I just thought, you know what? Why not just throw it out there? I threw an order out there to see, whoops. I threw an order out there to see, I just threw it at 1280. I thought, you know, if it hits 1280, I'll take all my profit and run. It'll be good. And sure enough, it hit. And then as you see here, what happened the next day? That day, that day on the chart that just popped up, that big long wick, that all the way down at 115, that option was going for 20, no, 16 or $18. 18 bucks, I think is about what it hit. So I sold it for 12 bucks the day before. And the next day, I would have made another 600 bucks if I would have left it alone. So see, it looked great until then. And then all of a sudden you're going, ah, I should have kept it. Now you're mad because you didn't stay in because it just tanked another 12 or 13 bucks and you would have made another six or seven or eight hundred dollars. If I would have just left the six, six thirty five, if I would have just left the two alone, could have sold them for 18 bucks and made 300 percent rate of return. I got out for 100 percent. Get in and out a couple of times. I could have made 300. <laughs> exactly. That's why we're crazy. So the woulda, coulda, shoulda, and that's the, that's the emotional side of trading that is difficult. The woulda, coulda, shoulda, kicking yourself because watch this. Look at what happened just a week and a half later. Right? This is that long shadow day where it was worth 18 bucks, 
Down here, it hit $95. That option had $30 of intrinsic value. I think it was going for $31 or $32 at that point. But how do you know? Because how many times have you seen it bounce and go back up and then all your profit goes away? That's the challenge of trading. The, re the reality is this was a 92% rate of return in I think 10 or 12 trading days. So, I mean, it's easy to, to cry about the money that you left on the table, which happens all the time. Now, here's another one. I'm going to hustle through the, the next few. This is one that did not work out spectacular, but we had an evening star, an evening doji star, a big giant drop in big volume, and it attacked. We had a double top, right? Lots of different patterns come together. And it's sitting right there at that 3420 is a support level. I'm looking at it saying, okay, if it breaks below this, if it breaks below this, then I'm good. Okay. So what happened? A couple of days later, it broke below. The entry point is at 3407. And there's the order. I bought a couple of these were in the money options. Okay. That were $2.20. Just bought three of them, right? Again, it's a small account that I was trading in. I think it was, I don't remember if it was one of my kids or not. I can't keep it straight. And sure enough, a few days later, it hit. I put an order out there for three bucks. This one right here. And this time I just sold one. Looking back in hindsight, I should have told, sold uh, two of them. But I didn't. I just sold the one. And then, of course, what happens? Oops, I'm trying to get my mouse back. It bounces up after it hits that one, which was almost at the target. I probably should have just sold the whole thing. If I was looking back on it, I would have just sold the whole thing, but I didn't, right? I held on to it all the way up to where it went to. And it wasn't exactly my wife just moved. Not only did it go up there, it hit the exit. And then what I also, the mistake I made on this and I'm human, I still make mistakes, right? Even though I've been at this for a long time, is I bought, I didn't buy as much time as I needed to give it room. So ultimately what happened, whoops, where did it go? Well, I thought I had the final one on there. Ultimately what happened is when it bounced back up, those options, because the time value was getting so short, I ended up bailing out of them. And you can see there, let me get it back here. I ended up bailing at the other two contracts, right? At a buck. So I ended up net net, I lost 160 bucks on this trade. So not huge. I mean, it was good to sell these, the one contract, banked a little bit of profit, took a third of the risk off the table. And then even though it went against me pretty bad and I lost over 50% from the original on these two contracts, I had that little bit of cushion there. So it wasn't as bad as it could have been. But at the same time, looking back and learning from this, I mean, obviously I should have sold two. I probably should have just sold all three of them because it was so close to the target. But one of the things I do is I scale out because then if it keeps moving in the direction that you want it to, then you continue to make profit, right? So it allows you to manage your emotions better. By scaling either in or out of the trade, it's, it's an emotional management tool, right? So now two more real quick. And again, these, these were all part of pattern of the week. And I just noticed we're plum out of time, but I'm going to hustle through these. This is another one, MDT. These next two are actually still, uh, they're still practice trades that are on, uh, but they're part way done. So MDT, this is the day I put it on patterns of the week. I said, look, we've got a triple top and we've also got an ascending triangle, two competing patterns. One's a reversal, one's a continuation. The question is which one will play out? And ultimately what happened is the next day it broke down. You can see we broke that up trend line right? And the triple top is what played out. Got big volume, a big move, a big giant break of that trend. And so what do we do here? I went to June, went longer term. Again, this was a hundred and something dollar stock, $116 stock. Looking at the target down here about 111. So I went and bought the 110s. I said, okay, where's the target? We're going to go longer term, buy one at the target, and they were only $2.70. This one was a little weird. They had some big spreads. So I was a little skittish at first. Then I decided, okay, I'm going to put it in the middle and see if it hits. Sure enough, it triggered. Just four contracts. So right, so there's a little over $1,000 on the line. Again, this is a small account. What happens the next day? Boom, it tanks. 
I thought, you know what? Whoops. How come that's not, do I have that? Oh, I don't. Um, I thought I put another one in here. So the next day when it dropped, you can see I sold half of it. I sold the two, two contracts at $3.20. So I banked 50 cents of profit, right? And still have the other two contracts there. So if it keeps dropping, I keep making more money. And we'll see. And that was that was yesterday right there. That's the candle from yesterday. That's the 25th. So, and the last one, before I wrap up real quick, is this is Vonage. This is a small dollar stock, right? It's only 12 bucks. But we have a beautiful head and shoulders there that had already broken below. Not only did it break below, but it rallied up and tapped the neckline. So this is exactly what I want to see. And it's sitting right there at the entry point. So danced around there for a couple of days, ended up picking up just three contracts, right? At 250, so 750 bucks. Not a ton of risk, not a huge stock either, but this is in the money, right? This is, we got 84 days, so we're out of ways, but they're the 14s and the stock's at 12 bucks or so, I think it was, is that right? And then lo and behold, that's what's happened the last few days. And I ended up selling two of these I threw two of the three out at 320. That you know what, if we bank it, it's dropped a bunch, it's likely to bounce. And if it bounces a little bit, then fine. But I ended up banking 70 cents a profit on these and there's still one contract sitting there. So if it continues to tank, then just more profit, right? And sure enough, yesterday, that's what happened. It bounced back up a little bit. So, so just to recap real quick. Yeah, I, last time I looked at it, it was up a little bit. I saw that, so. Which option is the best? In the money, at the money, or out of the money? And it all depends on which, what the pattern looks like. What does the chart look like? What is the best option for that moment right there? Which one's gonna be this best bang for your buck? Which one meets the risk reward the best? That really is the ultimate question. And it also depends on your risk tolerance. How much are you willing to risk? How much do you have to work with? How much can you handle mentally and emotionally, right? Because we're all different in that space. And ultimately patterns, are the ultimate guide. And hopefully those last few examples you just saw are enough for you to see that patterns can be very, very powerful. They are very, very powerful. So, and again, those are just recent examples of trades that I've done that all, they, all four were posted on, in fact, let me just show you real quick. I think I have that up. In case you haven't seen it and you want to see it, there's uh so this is, I, I don't have enough time to give a long tour, but this is patterns in a flash. And basically here's the pattern of the week. So these, there's eight up there and that, that'll continue to grow. We just started doing this a couple months ago, the pattern of the week. And then you've got flashcards, there's videos. So the flashcards are a training tool to train your eyes to see the patterns. The videos, there's over eight hours of video all about technical analysis and all about all the patterns, right? And then quizzes, which allows you to test your knowledge, see how much you learned. And there's a bonus in there. And then the risk reward calculator, it allows you to do risk reward. And there's the bonus video in here about risk reward, which that will show you what the calculator is for, right? Right there, the risk reward bonus. And then of course the pattern of the week. And then twice a month, we do a live class. So just like we're doing here, every, every uh, basically every two weeks, we do a live online class where we're talking about patterns or anything we want to really. So uh, what was I just gonna show you? I don't remember exactly, but so there's all the upcoming stuff. And of course, ways to connect with uh, us. And there will be a link, okay? There is a free two week trial. Amy just popped it in the chat box. You can click on that link and go get Patterns of Flash for two weeks. Test drive it. And if you like it, then buy it. It is, um, 
I don't remember exactly what the pricing is. It just changed and I forgot to, I totally forgot to add that in here. So you knew exactly how much it is. If you go sign up, sign up for the trial, you'll have it for two weeks and the pricing will be there. I'm, I, I apologize. I don't know how that slipped by me. Didn't even put that in here. Um, but you'll see it. Like I say, go, go take the two week trial. If you like it, love it, sign up for it. If you don't, I want to say, I think it's three forty nine or three ninety nine, if I remember right, for a quarter. So, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's it's either three forty nine or three ninety nine for a quarter. I can't remember exactly what it is. But either way, for eight hours of instruction, uh, eight hours of recorded on demand instruction, flashcards, the bonus videos, twice a month, a live class, and a pattern of the week. Actually, that Peloton is Amos here. No, he's not. Amos was here at the Patterns of Flash class we did two days ago, and he traded that Peloton. He said, I made enough on two contracts to pay for 14 months of Patterns of Flash, just for that one trade. Okay, okay, Will, thank you. Um, I guess I could go look there, huh? 249, I stand corrected. It's less than I thought. I thought they'd raised it up. I thought, I thought it got raised up to, I thought it was, it was 249, I know that. But I thought that it got raised to either 299 or 349. But uh, yeah, 100% off, limited time only. <laughs> yeah, for two weeks. So it's only 249, which is an even better deal than I thought. So either either go do the two week trial or just buy it. I mean, again, I'm I'm a little biased, but it's well worth it in my opinion. So, all right, appreciate that, Will. Thank you all for coming and having some fun. Hopefully, it was uh, good for you. And if you have any questions, feel free to, to reach out. If you have patterns in Flash, you have an email. There is, uh, I don't know if that showed up there. Yeah, you can send a message here that comes directly to me right inside patterns of Flash. So if you subscribe to it and you have a question, fire me off an email. Just don't ask me if a trade is good or bad or indifferent. I can't give you recommendations or advice. We can talk very generically speaking, but nothing specific. So anyway, awesome. Thank you, Patrick. I appreciate that. So appreciate y'all coming and having some fun and uh, look forward to the next Coach's Corner. We'll see you then. And I look forward to seeing y'all in the next Patterns and Flash. Y'all take care. Bye-bye.